modern technologies that have been developed to harness the solar energy. Uh, I divided it into two categories, solar electric, uh, you can also call it photovoltaic, or the short form is PV, or solar thermal. So in the so solar electric version, we directly convert solar power into electricity, whereas for solar thermal case, we convert solar energy into heat and somehow use that heat to do either space heating, water heating, or convert that heat into electricity, okay? So from the first category, we have the flat panel TV. That's basically the most well-known technology that everybody uh, kind of says TV, photovoltaic or solar power. That is what comes to your mind. I'll talk about it a bit more. There, there is another category of the solar electric technology, which is called concentrated TV. Concentrated PV is very similar to PV, but uh, before, uh, for the sun, uh, for the uh, solar power before reaching the PV that converts solar energy into electricity, there is an optical stage. So you have an optical stage that concentrates the solar energy and then delivers it to the solar cell to convert it to electricity. From for the concentrated PV, there are low concentration high concentration PV, and for high concentration, you, 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 that optical stage can be like uh, based on reflection or based on refraction, okay? Also, there is thin film technology that, that's very similar to PV, but the, like, the, molecule, uh, the mo molecular structure of the material is slightly different, uh, so they provide more electrical power density per mass, okay? I'm, I, I put it in parentheses because I'm not going to talk about it. Just if you're interested to uh, read or understand more about thin film, you can go and do some Google search, you'll learn a lot. But on the solar thermal part, we have, we do, as I said, we, we want to generate uh, heat from solar energy. We can use it uh, by parabolic drops or power technology, dish sterling, or just use it for hot water generation. So what, what is going to happen from this point on, I'm going to briefly explain each one of these uh, technologies so you get an idea how to work. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. I'm not going to dive deep into the technical details, but if there is something that is bothering you and you want to understand more, don't be shy. So that's photovoltaic, or uh, the short form is PV. It's basically based on semiconductor technology. We have a P-type technology, uh, P-type semiconductor, and an N-type uh, semi semiconductor. They are attached next to each other. When this happens, something called a junction forms, and this junction has a very interesting uh, 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 property that if an external energy uh, comes to that junction, it, 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 it has the potential to release electrons and holes, and once you collect the electrons and flow the electrons into an electri electric circuit, you can actually extract the power uh, that uh, is stored in, in the system. So basically what happens, in short, you have the semiconductor junction, P-type, N-type, uh, sunlight hits, and then uh, your electron and uh, electrons and holes are released. You connect this uh, whole thing to an electric circuit. Electrons flow the circuit. They convert that external power, which here is in form of sunlight, into electricity. So the photovoltaic is uh, used for residential purposes. We have the PV panels that are basically that semiconductor technology, that diode, that uh, are fixed on the roofs. In this technology, P, uh, the panels are fixed. Keep in mind why I'm uh, emphasizing on fixing, because during the day, sun is moving in the sky, and from uh, throughout the year, also the sun angle versus earth changes. So if you want to get the maximum power out of the system, like the best thing is to always point to the sun, okay? So basically move with the sun, 
during the day and also move during the year from, let's say, winter to summer. But that all uh, three comes down to economic measures, you know? So if you want to build this, if it works to build all those gears, all the mechanical and moving parts to just move these things, or even on the roof of the house, we have the physical capability of doing it. So once you sit down and do all the calculation, you see, you know what? I'm better off to put the solar panel on the roof, not move it. Yes, it won't be the best case, it won't be optimal, but even the suboptimal case is good enough to generate enough energy, enough electricity that a household can use for uh, generating electricity. From residential, we go to commercial. Commercial solar powers are uh, slightly larger installations. For, for residential, for example, you, you need anywhere between three to five kilowatts of installation. Each panel is about 200 watts. So, you know, you need 10 to 15 pounds, or uh, 15 to about, uh, what, 20 pounds, and that's enough. So for commercial purposes, the amount of power that we want to generate is slightly lo uh, larger. It's maybe in like tens of kilowatts to maybe hundreds of kilowatts, depending on the amount of area you have. And usually they call these buildings as, as big boxes because they look like big boxes, like your grocery store of the Yerevan city. But it, it, it is an example of a big box because it has a flat roof, nothing happening in that roof, and it's a perfect location to install a uh, solar panel. Now, what is the business the, the approach for that is different. Some people come and lease the roof of that big box from the owner and say, you know, I'll pay you this much rent, I'll install the solar panel on that, and then I'll offset your electricity bill by this much, and all the excess power that I'm generating from this system, I'll push it back to the network. Okay? Or some people, uh, if they would like to do that, they just buy the solar system and install on top of their big box. There are, there are various business plans for this, and each person has a different approach. But again, since these big boxes aren't structurally very sturdy, they can't tolerate uh, heavy stuff on their roof, right? So basically, again, this whole thing uh, can't be too heavy. Therefore, uh, they, they usually choose to have uh, installations that are moving. It's just fixed and it stays there. And mostly, they are even flat. You know that like the, op uh, the optimal angle, because of how the earth is tilted with respect to the sun, is depending on where you are on earth, it's kind of about like 30 degrees. Right? So basically, if you want to be optimal, these panels should be tilted up by 30 degrees from the roof. But again, because of those mechanical and practical reasons, they choose to put the panels flat on the roof and operate at sub-optimal operating points. The third version is utility scale. And as you see, there is this huge area that is dedicated to solar panels, and you have all this maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of solar panels sitting next to each other. And this is based actually a solar power plant that is generating electricity in the range of gigawatts, or at least megawatts, depending on how big that is. And, but for utility scale, because everything sits on the ground, you, you have the freedom of choosing to track the sun in both and in both directions, like azimuth and elevation, or put your solar panels in uh, north and south directions that only track the sun during the day from east to west, or if you want to avoid all those like moving parts and reliability issues that they cause because they may break. If they break, it won't work, right? So you say, okay, I don't want to do that. Everything. Uh, these are all different options that you would see happening in, in the real world. And how much is the area of the 
Audience? The audience. How much? It depends on how much uh, power you want to generate. So let me tell you uh, back up the envelope calculation. The, on the average, the maximum solar irradiance we receive on the Earth is 1,000 watts per meter squared. <coughs> okay? One kilowatt, but e e every square meter, uh, uh, for every square meter we receive one kilowatt of solar power. And each, like the silicon technology, at the system level is anywhere between 15 to 20 percent efficient. So 15 percent of that power is converted into electricity. So now if you want to generate uh, let's say one megawatt power, you go back in efficiency, you calculate how much uh, solar power you need, and then you know that in every square meter you receive thousand, and you calculate how much area you need to co cover to get an energy. Okay, so that was the flat panel technology, which is very well known, the most developed technology, and that's what most people actually now using and doing this. From this point on, the technology that I'm going to talk about, they're all, they all have prototype stage. Although people have been working on them for decades, still they are in prototype stage because we have to learn a lot of things. You know, we build it in the lab, but when it goes under the sun in the field, lots of crazy things are happening that you weren't expecting. So still you have to go next to vision, think better and better, and as you do this, interesting ideas come to your mind and you start working on those. So these are the things that really have a lot of room for contribution. And, and as I go through these things on like maybe on like 10 or 20 percent of your brain, you start kind of playing about, okay, so how I could do things better or in a different way. Okay? So the low concentration PV, which is also known as LCPV, is a similar thing. You have the same flat silicon uh, cells sitting next to each other. Let me go here. Sorry. So each one of these uh, cells is one quarter of a normal uh, uh, silicon cell, and they are all connected in series. See, you come here. This is connected in series. Series, they all go. Okay, so all these cells are connected in series. And there is this optical stage before the sunlight hits the cell that does the concentration, okay? So always in concentrating the solar power, you have that optical stage, and depending on how much you want to concentrate, you design that optical stage. So in this case, which is, this is a technology by Sun Power, uh, that their headquarters in, is in uh, Silicon Valley, and they build everything in India, uh, and they just unveiled their first prototype power plant a few weeks ago based on this technology. This technology they call it C7, and they call it C7 because the optical layer concentrates seven times. Okay, so the optical layer concentrates the sun like seven times and then sends it to normal uh, silicon cells. And I just put this picture here so you get an idea how big this system is. You know, they're way taller than like a normal uh, person. So these aren't like small things. There's a big, big systems. They are usually aligned north to south direction, and they have all these big gears to turn this system from east to west during the day. Okay. And and just imagine to design that you need the, the electric motor, you need the precision. You need your sensor, you need all the software that sits behind the system to do that control and the motion and stuff. It's not only the mechanical part, it's not only the electric part, it's like a combination of all the different knowledge that one person can have. Uh, again, in the solar electric, we have now high concentration. Uh, I'm sorry, Arti, can I ask yes. you a question? Uh, so s seven times a higher concentration of, of the solar radiation, right? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, does that mean the 15% efficiency is now sevenfold more, uh, yields sevenfold more? Uh, more what's the... What's the yes, you are correct. However, uh, basically here what they do, they use one quarter of each cell. So basically they reduce the area of the cell by a 
factor of four, they increase the concentration by a factor of seven. So basically, the amount of current that we get from each cell is seven over four of a regular uh, cell. Okay, and Sun Power is very famous for itself because they developed this IP, this technology that, as as you remember, I mentioned the TV is like a dial. N pipe and T pipe sitting on top of each other. So one of your electro electrodes has to be on this side, the other electrode has to be on that side, right? Because you have these two layers on top of each other. But some power kind of created this technology that they actually brought both electrodes on the back side. And the importance of that is so when you want to have an electrode here, you have to have these very tiny wires that are sitting on the top layer to collect electrons, right? And then once you have this tiny line, they, they prevent the uh, sunlight to reach the cell. So it basically is suboptimal. But now some power brought everything on the back side, so there are no bus bars or lines on top. So they basically utilize sunlight in a better manner compared to regular and they use the same cell to build this because they already had the technology just design the optical stage before that okay so for the high concentration PV as I mentioned before we have uh, we have to have uh, again that optical stage before it reaches the solar cell that optical stage can be based on reflection like here you ha we have two mirrors, a primary mirror, the sunlight hits the primary mirror, is reflected to a secondary mirror, and then it is reflected again inside a prism that then directs the sunlight at the bottom, which is a multi-junction solar cell. So what is a multi-junction solar cell? Multi-junction solar cell is basically a solar cell that is comprised of several junctions sitting on top of each other. In this particular case, like the most uh, well-known multi-junction solar cell is a three-junction solar cell. That one junction is gallium arsenide, and the second one is germanium, and the third one is gallium indium phosphide. Okay? And what is the importance of this thing? So the junction that is created uh, with each one of the semiconductor technologies it has a different band gap. Basically, it, it means that it responds to a different light spectrum of sunlight, okay? Which means, uh, like for regular silicon, it only has one uh, band gap and only can capture a certain spectral band of solar energy based on the photon of that light spectrum that is coming to, or is reaching the, the that uh, the silicon and the rest are gone because they, they, they do not they actually they, they only become heat okay because as I said the efficiency is let's say 15% or 20% the rest like 80 or 75% uh, of the energy is converted into heat because it doesn't it doesn't do anything to the semiconductor but here you have three junctions they sit on top of each other as the sun goes through this stack of junctions, each junction responds to a certain spectrum and converts the energy that is coming in that spectrum into electricity. So we expect the multi-junction solar cells to be more efficient, right? Because they, they convert more of the solar energy into electricity, which are, they are close to 40% efficient compared to 20%. But at the same time, because of this complicated technology, they are very, very expensive. They are not as cheap as like a simple silicon technology that everybody can do it. Because initially, this technology was developed uh, by Boeing and NASA for uh, space applications, for powering the satellites, for powering like uh, solar panels on uh, international space station, uh, space station, and for those applications, mining is not a problem. They just want to do this space project. If it's like $100 billion, there is always money for that. But when it comes to like uh, 
business and solar power technologies on Earth, the money is an important thing. So they can't use the same amount of triple junction cells to collect energy from the sun. So therefore, they only can afford to use a very small area, one centimeter by one centimeter, to collect that energy. But to compensate for that area, they use a like, relatively cheap uh, optical layer or optical stick to concentrate the solar energy into that small area. Does this make sense? Well done. Very great. So, uh, you, you can see this uh, technology is being uh, anywhere from 500 to 700 concentration. And this other technology is uh, refractive. They use Fresnel lens. They use Fresnel lens to do the same thing to concentrate the sunlight on the solar cell that is of the same multi junction type. Yes? Uh, we just mean that the number of junctions is Not necessarily. So, uh, very quickly, by, um, so the solar, uh, if, if this is your spectrum, which is not right, it doesn't work, but that's okay. Just imagine what I'm doing, right? So, <laughs> this is the energy that we get from the sun. Energy with respect to the spectrum. These are the high concentration version of the photovoltaic, and I'll give you some practical uh, action product that I have here. This is uh, uh, the reflective version built by a company called Focus. It is located in uh, San Jose, in California, Silicon Valley. As you can see, this is on two stages of a mirror uh, primary stage, secondary mirror, and then it goes inside its prison, and the cell is located. Bottom of the thing. This is one of the companies I directly work with. 
actually three years ago when we started, I tell you about the uh, power electronics stuff that I started designing. This company was the first partner that we actually developed a product for. And they put each one of the cells next to each other. They create a panel. And the panels become like a big tracker like this. You have 540 of these cells on this tracker. Each tracker has a huge electric motor that tracks the sun in two axes, both elevation and y. Because once you do a 500 to 700 times concentration, you have to be precisely following the, uh, the sun. If you're off by, let's say, half a degree, then your optical state is not going to work. It's not going to do the concentration right, and the, the sunlight is not going to go inside the prism. You'll see the sunlight being concentrated there. Okay? So for higher concentration ratios, uh, the tracking is essential. And basically, what happens in your optical layer has to see the sun. If cloud comes and passes by the sun during the time that the sun is behind the cloud, the system is down. It's generating nothing. So therefore, this kind of technology is very good for areas that have very high solar irradiance, like deserts. Okay, so all places that have deserts, they have like long days, no cloud, and high solar irradiance. This kind of technology is the best because it works all the time and it has like double the efficiency of uh, regular flat panels, but it has the problems of tracking and electric motors, control software, and all these kind of things. The other version for the refractive, refractive version is a company called Analyx. Actually, the CTO of this company is Armenian. His name is Balan Garbujian and they're located in the Los Angeles area. It's very similar to Soul Focus technology. What they do, they have this huge mega module. Each mega module is comprised of these compartments. They're basically empty boxes made of aluminum. On one side, you have these uh, parquets of Breno lens. They're all, you know, molded or somehow built out of plastic. On one side and on the other side, you have these rows of solar cells, so basically they scan, they also have heat because they are 40% efficient, which means 60% of the input solar power is generated. that's a lot of heat, especially when it's concentrated on these little spots. So you have to have a nice uh, uh, heat sink to get rid of the heat. Why? Because solar uh, semiconductor technology uh, kind of degrades, it's, it's uh, efficiency drops, it's uh, capability of generating power drops as its temperature goes up. So, like the semiconductor technology or heat, heat technology doesn't like heat. So you have to always push the heat away as much as you can. So this is the refractive technology version by Amelix. And now we go into solar thermal technologies, where we use we basically convert solar energy into um, into heat. The first uh, technology is parabolic trough. You have this huge field of uh, parabolic trough. They're all mirrors. And you can compare the size of the human that is standing next to it. And at the focal point of this uh, parabolic trough, you have an evacuated cube. Okay, evacuated cube is like a cube that has like a layer of uh, glass around it, and the area between the tube and the glass is evacuated to prevent the prevent heat loss. Right? You hear the molecules all the heat inside the system. So what happens that they again are aligned north to south, and uh, you have all these control gears and electric motors that track the system from east to west every day. And they concentrate the solar energy on this tube. And because it's concentrated, maybe 30 to 60 times concentration, it generates about 400 degrees C uh, temperature at the receiver, which is this tube. And then they transfer this heat uh, into the boiler of a normal uh, steam power plant and generate uh, electricity. You know, in the steam power plants, all you need to do is to generate steam that is superheated and then push it through a tur turbine and then turbine turns the generator and you have electricity. Now, like a coal power plant generates steam by burning coal, petroleum power plant burns petroleum to generate steam, and here they 
And this picture also I thought it was interesting to generate how uh, shows how they do the maintenance. Because after a while you have a layer of dust on these mirrors and it kind of degrades the system performance. So every once in a while you have to wash them. And this is how they do the maintenance. But this is something that basically was developed as a prototype in like late 20th century. Okay? And the new age version of this is a product that was developed by a company called Osra. This was in Silicon Valley too, and recently it was acquired by Arriva, which is a huge, big uh, company in France that they do a lot of <coughs> power plants. So they started like a, a sector on renewable energies and solar power, and as part of that development, they purchased uh, the technology from Osra. What Osra is doing is it says, you know what, making all those parabolic troughs is a bit, the technique is difficult. <coughs> it, it becomes very expensive to kind of curve the uh, glass and put like the reflective layers behind it. What I'll do, I'll use like flat mirrors, but pieces of flat mirrors, and it will control the angle of each one of these uh, rows separately to achieve the same purpose. The whole purpose is that uh, to, to, re to reflect the sunlight from these uh, surfaces to the receiver and generate heat. And this is the idea of the Ostra. And so in order to, for you to kind of not get too bored, I'll show you a movie to see how this works. I didn't have the movie yet. Basically, the short movie shows how the sunlight hits the mirror, reflects to the receiver, becomes heat, and the heat goes through the boiler, turbine, and generates electricity. So this is that technology. <laughs> These are uh, uh, basically pipes, and those are receivers. So it all uh, reflects the sun, generates heat, and heat is transferred to the, to the pipes to this basically boiler, or to the heat transfer area, heat, and then the superheated the steam comes through the <coughs> turbine, it turns the turbine, becomes mechanical power, and mechanical power turns the generator and uh, generates electricity. Okay? So it's basically the same thing. It's a, a steam power plant, but the heat comes from the sun instead of coal. This was, uh, so efficiency from solar to thermal is 20, about 24, 25%, and usually steam power plants are about like 30% efficient. So it's like the one third of 24, which is 8%. So from sun to electricity, you'll have 8%. It's basically less efficient than normal. It is, well, it depends what the efficiency is. So Power plant, you uh, no, not power oh, the, the PV. Yes. Oh, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. If I may intervene, uh, I think it, the, the, the one of the last lectures I mentioned that it is more important to look at the cost of the peak power that you provide rather than the efficiency. The efficiency can be even low, but the cost, if it is lower, then you have the benefit. That's the point. And again, when it comes to efficiency, don't be too distracted because as I mentioned, solar energy comes off so free. You don't pay for it. But we are paying for the device yeah. instead of paying for the system. Absolutely. So if you have a system that is 1% efficient, but it's cheaper than a system that is like 20% efficient, people are going to buy the cheaper one. People want to say, oh, you know, I'm going to pay 100 times more, but it's like, uh, you know, 10 times more. Right? So you always have to put yourself, because you want to expand this technology, and people, when they go, let's say, to store to buy something, they first look at, like, the price. If it's cheaper, okay, it's more <coughs> attractive. They go to the next one. But it's already too expensive. They want to, oh, you know, by the way, this is more like efficient. Especially if it comes to this kind of, maybe if a person wants to buy
provide like a cell phone or this kind of thing, they might pay for it. But those are small compared to this. Okay. The other solar thermal uh, technology is uh, solar power. The way this works, basically you have these flat mirrors, they are stats. Each one of these flat mirrors is kind of uh, tracking the sun in the like two directions, and what they do, they concentrate the solar energy on top of this tower. Again, they generate heat, and the heat goes to a normal steam power plant, and it's the same story. You can compare the height to the normal person, and here you get higher concentrations at, to, at the level of 10,000 and about 600 degrees C uh, temperature. That was again to a late 20th century prototype. What is happening now in Pasadena, there is this company called Big Solar, that they are uh, building a different version. So they have this smaller heliostat, so they are more manageable. And they have basically the, the main contribution of this company is developing the, the software behind controlling each one of these heliostats. So the way the software works, it controls each one of the mirrors so that the temperature at the top of this tower is constant. Right? So if the the cloud comes and goes away and these kind of things, like uh, the the software automatically kind of diverts some of these mirrors off focus to actually always keep that temperature constant so the system moves less. So it's a, it's a simple thing, right? You have the racks, you have a flat mirror, some electric motors, but you have to develop that software that takes care of it. The other technology is dish sterling. It's a similar idea. Here, mirrors are kind of uh, like a satellite dish. They concentrate the solar power in the focal point where you have a sterling engine. Sterling engine is a heat engine. It's a closed cycle heat engine, like uh, the engine in your car, like your the car in your engine is a focal cycle. Uh, on one end is your hot side, the other end is your cold side, and it basically converts uh, heat into mechanical power motion, and then you have a magnetic circuit around it, like a generator, and get power from it. Again, this is uh, from a sterling energy system company that two years ago went bankrupt, because they basically couldn't design a system that was financially viable. But anyways, uh, what they designed was, had was a system with 37 feet diameter and each one of these dishes generated 25 kilowatt of AC power. And here I, I want to show you how these huge monstrous dishes are dragging this down. So every morning, I'll play it again, uh, they have this software that wakes up the system, they track the sun, and at, at night, they come back to the morning position to start tracking the next morning. But again, this system doesn't exist anymore, the company went bankrupt, but the new age version of this is designed by Infinia uh, Corporation, which is in the uh, state of Washington, and they uh, decided to build a very simple system, like the mirrors of a bunch of like flat mirrors, the system is not too big, it's only 22 feet diameter, and it only generates 3.5 kilowatt. Okay, it's a small system, it's basically good enough power for like one residential home, and the sterling engine that they have here, as you see, it's very tiny. It's, a, it's not too complicated, it's not heavy, it's like practically it's more viable. This company still hasn't gone to mass production. They are still developing customers and they are still trying to have prototypes, uh, uh, install systems to validate that. But they are still doing business and hopefully they will secure. To generate solar uh, hot water. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry to. Uh, the, the, I have been always wondering yes. this uh, fish sterling uh, system, they, are, uh, uh, they have been promising. They still remain promising. What's the matter with this? What is the uh, key uh, issue with this uh, problem that are not really becoming uh, a very proliferated option? One of the main drawbacks of the Sterling engine systems, which is like compared to PV, is that the Sterling uh, system has a lot of moving parts. Mechanically, uh, it, it might not be reliable. 
because when a person designs a flat housing system and you want to sell it, you, you, you give a warranty for 25, 30 years. You say, hey, I give this system to you. After 30 years, I'll come back, measure the tower. Uh, I'm confident that the tower is going to be more than 80% of day one, 30 years ago. And nothing is going to happen. If it breaks, I'll change the panel and all this kind of thing. But in this case, the main problem is the reliability. We have a lot of moving parts, and people still don't believe that a Sterling engine can last for 30 years. Although this Infinia company designed a Sterling engine for NASA for the deep space missions. So because when the space vehicles go deep into space, they don't see sunlight anymore, okay? So they can't use uh, photovoltaic to actually use the sunlight to generate the electricity need of the car. So they use atomic reaction in the deep space uh, vehicles to create heat. And then they use Infinia's Stirling engine to convert that heat into electricity. As I said, the Stirling engine is a closed cycle engine, so it doesn't have any exhaust or anything. There's it's really no combustion. Yeah. So they have a proven technology of long-lasting systems, because now a couple of their systems are in NASA's mission. They are kind of going deep into space. But since they only built one or two for NASA, they are still considered prototypes. So once it comes to mass manufacturing, the precision and all these kind of things becomes a big issue because, for example, if you design the piston to go inside a cylinder that has like a fraction of like a micron clearance, okay, you might be able to build one, spend like $100,000 and build one or two. But when it comes to mass manufacturing, you can't uh, shoot for those precisions at lower cost. So they're just battling uh, to balance these things, like manufacturing, reliability, like engineering design, and all these things. Which is very complicated, very difficult. But exciting, you know? Good. So, quickly on the solar hot water, this is flat plate collectors are the easiest way. You, you put like a simple uh, plate there, you have passages for the water to go through and you paint it dark. There you go, it will kind of collect sunlight and the cold water enters, <coughs> hot water comes out, you get temperatures in the range of like 80 degrees C or something. One step more advanced version of this is just you basically cut all these sections and put them in an evacuated tube. And the evacuated tube is basically acts like an insulator around the this plate, so it prevents the heat to be uh, wasted to the environment. In, in this case, you want to keep all the heat. In photovoltaic case, you want to get rid of the heat because it kind of uh, degrades the, the cell. And another version of, so what happens here, because everything is an evacuated tube, you can't flow fluid through the pipe, so what you do, you actually use like a heat pipe technology, it's a very interesting technology in thermodynamics and mechanical engineering. And what it does, you put this tube in tilted manner, and then it automatically creates a cycle. It kind of uh, collects the heat, comes up in this portion, gives away the heat, and turns into liquid, and kind of trickles down again. That's a very interesting technology. Or another similar version is that you have a tube, and then you put it on a bigger evacuated tube, but you put a layer, a reflective layer. On this side, so it reflects the sunlight and kind of does a little bit of concentration. The practical version of this technology is this. So you have the evacuated tube, you have the heat pipe inside, and then all the heads that are sticking out are in this uh, manifold. Your main heat transfer fluid goes in the manifold, gets the heat, heats up, and comes out. And the third version that I haven't seen any like uh, mass manufactured uh, version yet are called compound parabolic concentrated or CPC. Basically, you 
have like two reflectors and your evacuator is a tube. Uh, these, the, the, these are the, the design of this optic is based on non imaging optics. It's a very interesting optical physics if you want to go and study. It's called non imaging optics. It's different from like uh, convex or concave mirrors or uh, lenses. They are, they are imaging optics. This is intentionally non imaging because the purpose of this optic is not to create an image, but it's just to concentrate the the solar energy into your output aperture, which in this case is uh, yeah, is that evacuated tube. The good thing with this technology is that it responds well to disperse uh, sunlight. When you have uh, cloud, you have dispersed sunlight. It responds to that, and also you don't need to track the sun. You know, it has a big acceptance angle, and uh, no matter where the sun is. It still works well, and this is like a cutout 